Very good. And that's all yours, Colin. Cool. Thanks, Liz. Well, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, nice, to, nice to see a few faces on the screen, at least a few. Um, and just as Liz mentioned, then I am, um, well, I don't, I don't like to call myself a whiskey expert. Other people call me a whiskey expert. That's fine. Uh, but I wouldn't call myself that. But I'm from Scotland. I love whiskey. Uh, know a little bit about whiskey. Um, I'll share a bit of that with you today. And I think it would just be nice to, to go through some of these whiskies together um, and share what we think of them. Um, so thanks, Liz, for doing the housekeeping on, on Zoom, um, how to use Zoom. I think most people have probably had a bit of practice of that over the past year or so. Uh, but yeah, we'll have um, mics on mute throughout, maybe at the end, depending how we go for time, uh, we might be able to switch on if you do want to say a few comments or whatever else at the end. But uh, other than that, uh, we'll stay on mute, just provide background noises and so we can keep things flowing. Um, I can see a lot of people have their names set to their real name. That's that's good because that helps to know who you are if you're putting comments in the chat. If your name's not already set, feel free to change it if you do want to let us know your real name other than some uh, random numbers or some other um, funny names. But uh, feel free if you do want to change that. You just go to participants, find your own name, click on more, and then you can rename there. Um, so feel free as we go as well. Thanks Liz for mentioning to let us know how many people are in your in your bubbles. Uh, and then also if you do want to put in the chat as we get underway, just maybe where you're joining us from as well. Nice to know who we've got in the room. Um, I think probably most people are in Auckland. And uh, on that note, thanks for, for uh, spending the time to be with us this afternoon, this afternoon and not going out for a picnic. Uh, maybe you've already been for a picnic, I don't know, or uh, maybe you'll take the leftover drams for the picnic afterwards, but regardless, thanks for being here. Uh, and before I forget to mention it as well, I think we do have a birthday amongst us, unless that was just a joke on Facebook, but uh, happy birthday to Jacques. Uh, so Jacques, I think you got your camera off there, but hope, you, hope you're hearing me at least, and happy birthday to you. Okay, so... Without further ado, I think uh, we'll roll on in and uh, get into a bit of whiskey, why not, eh? Um, so hopefully you've all got your sample bottles. Uh, they're numbered one to six. We've made it nice and easy for you. And you've got your tasting mat as well, which has pictures of all the bottles on it. And we're gonna follow in that order. Uh, so starting with whiskey number one, which is the Teeling. Uh, so you've also got your little booklet and you can if you want to, refer to this throughout. It has some tasting notes on it. Um, I'll mention a bit of the tasting notes, but of course, taste is very subjective. So you might taste different things. Don't worry if you don't taste exactly what it says on, on, the, on the booklet. Um, but we'll go through the tasting notes anyway, see if we can maybe pick up some of them. But basically, it's just about enjoying some whiskey today. So make sure you've got whiskey number one in your glass. And this one is an Irish whiskey. So today we're going to taste one Irish whiskey uh, and five Scotch. Uh, we won't get into the debate. I can see Trevor there over whether or not uh, Ireland or Scotland did whiskey first, first or who did it best. Well, I'll happily concede that Ireland probably did it first. Uh, so Irish were distilling long before the Scots, or a little bit before the Scots at least. Uh, but uh, Irish and Irish and Scotch have juked it out over the centuries. So. This one, uh, the Teeling 13-year-old, um, it spent 11 years of its life in ex-bourbon barrels and then the final two years in a Carcavelos white Portuguese fortified wine cask. On the bottle, it does actually say white port. I'll get into that a bit more in a second. Um, but it's distilled 2007, bottled in 2020, and it's at 49.5% ABV. So, I'm sure many people are well experienced in how to taste whiskey, but just uh, just in case we'll go through the basics. First of all, you want to look at the color. Uh, you can say something interesting about the color if you like, but you don't taste with your eyes. Uh, you, so um, anyone that's ever had whiskey in their eyes will know that it hurts uh, to get whiskey in your eyes. So don't taste with your eyes and uh, don't judge a whiskey by its color, just like you don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, but you can look at the color anyway, and it might give an indication as to maybe the cask type used or the length of time it's spent in the barrel. But really, when you're getting into the nose, uh, you're getting maybe on this one a little bit of the, the citrusy notes, the caramel toffee, maybe a bit of spice. Let's give it a taste, if you haven't done so already. It's 
So straight up on that, uh, you might be getting a little bit of the ripe, ripe apples, kind of you're getting a bit of honey, honeyed apples perhaps, but a marmalade sweetness. Um, I should have mentioned as well, maybe just in case, uh, that a few things you want to have on hand while we go through this tasting. Um, you might want to have some, some water. Uh, so water both for cleansing your palate and just for adding a drop or two. You can see some people already doing that drop or two to the whiskey as we go. Um, or, or tea maybe wants to have a pals on hand there. Uh, but uh, a little bit of water can help to sometimes open up the whiskeys. So we might go through and uh, try, try that with each whiskey. Um, you might want to use a pipette. Um, so if you've got something like, well, this is a kind of a bit more of a fancy kind of whiskey dropper. Uh, you can use something like that or just a little dropper like this. And that's just so you can control how many drops are actually going into the whiskey. Failing that, if you don't have one of them, the good old Ralphie teaspoon works well. Uh, so you can just take a few drops of water and add it to the whiskey. But you'd always want to taste the whiskey neat without any water first. Um, and then you can add a little bit of water just see if it opens up. So let me tell you a little bit more about this whiskey then. And uh, uh, it's got teeling on the bottle but the whiskey was actually distilled at Cooley. Um, that's because Teeling as a distillery only started up in 2015. Uh, it was founded by the Teeling brothers, Jack and Stephen Teeling. Uh, their father, John Teeling, he's really regarded as being the really the godfather of Irish whiskey. He revived Irish whiskey back in the 1980s. He took over what was a, a potato, uh, potato alcohol plant. So basically in Ireland, they were producing uh, alcohol from potatoes and he transformed this potato alcohol plant into the Cooley distillery, distillery in 1987. So he sold out to Beam in 2012. Uh, Beam of course today known as Beam Suntory, later taken over by Suntory. But with that buyout one of the one of the agreements was that they would keep some casks, so the Teeling family were allowed to keep some casks and with these 16,000 casks John Teeling, he started another distillery uh, called the Great Northern Distillery in Dundalk. It's very close to, to Cooley. And the brothers, Jack and Stephen, Cooley, uh, Jack and Stephen Teeling, uh, they started the Teeling Distillery in Dublin. Uh, so they started distilling in 2015. And that means that any stock that's older than, what are we now, 2021? Where did 2020 go? Uh, but anything that's older than five or six years old, then it wasn't distilled at Teeling, uh, but comes from the old Cooley stock. So this one, as I mentioned, then spent its first 11 years in ex-bourbon casks, and it was the Teeling uh, brothers, or really under their master distiller, Alex, who decided to put it in uh, the Carcavelos port wine cask for its final two years. Uh, now, immediately there, I've slipped up and said port wine, because in actual fact, this cask that was used is not a port wine. So I think the reason that Teeling have decided to put white port on the label is just because people know port more as a style, but strictly speaking, Teeling, uh, sorry, not Teeling, <laughs> strictly speaking, uh, port has to come from the region near to Oporto. Uh, so I lived in, well, Villanova de Gaia, which is on the south side of the Douro River, uh, across from Porto back in 2008, 2009. Uh, when I was there, I was teaching English and French. So somewhere in Portugal, there's some 20 something year olds that speak French with a bit of a Scottish accent. Uh, but I was uh, working in a school really teaching English and French and then I had a part-time job working in port wine cellars. So I would take tourists through the cellars, um, explain the, the port making process and uh, do uh, port tastings with them. And I think that the people in, in Porto, in Villanova de Gaia and in the Douro Valley region in the north of Portugal wouldn't be too impressed really to see that Teeling have called this a port finish because uh, strictly speaking it's not port. Uh, so the Carcavelos casks that are used, they come from the region of Carcavelos, which sits down closer to Lisbon. Uh, so it's really between Lisbon and the coast, on the west coast of Portugal. Uh, it's a very small uh, wine region, one of the smallest in the world. I think today it's just about 25 acres. Um, and so it's producing a, a port style. It's more similar to like a tawny port. Uh, so it does have a lot of the same characteristics really as port. It's from Portugal as well, uh, but strictly speaking, not a port. So what do we think of that one? Any, any first impressions on there? Feel free to write them in the chat.
Yeah, I mean, Arha is quite rightfully saying the whiskey mellows out quite beautifully. Um, and as soon as I added water, it just really brought out those chocolate and ginger notes. I've written, mm. yeah, melons and pears and real zesty. And it's kind of that real fresh hay sort of character on the nose as well for me. But mm. yeah, and Rob, yeah, a medley of butterscotch and apple, gentle toffee apple. Yeah, value for money on this one, definitely. Yeah, yeah. At what, so, yeah, 179, so... 179. Yeah, so this is the um, the fourth in the, the Brabazon series, I believe. Um, I've not tried any of the previous ones. I think T, you probably have. Um, but I think their their first of the series that was in a port cask, so real port cask. Um, I think they did one in Sherry, one in Pedro Jimenez Sherry as well. And so this is the fourth and final one of the Brabazon series. So yeah, I think it's really showing the best of what they can do at Teeling. So is this uh, the actual, the final one in this series, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fourth and final, yeah. And so the whole series, was it just in fortified wine cast is what they were looking at, or just wine cast finishes in general? Or? Um, fortified wine casks, yeah. So, yeah. so I think the first one, yeah, was port, and then sherry, uh, Pedro Jimenez, another type of sherry. Uh, and then this one is the fourth. Better round out the set. Mm. Yeah. So so yeah, I think it's a it's a good it's a really good um, expression of what can what can come from Ireland. Uh, I think that a lot of the time people always assume that Irish whiskey is always triple distilled. It's not always triple distilled. Uh, this one is double distilled and it's single malt. Um, so a lot of the, the sort of the sort of perceptions perhaps of Irish whiskey is that it's always triple distilled. Uh, that it's always not peated, but there are. Very good expressions of peated whiskey coming out of Ireland. Teeling have one, in fact, called the Black Pits. Um, so yeah, it's a nice, um, nice way to, to start off, I think. Yeah, I think the water really does tame it down a bit. Um, it's quite, it's quite hot. It's quite spicy. Um, but yeah, I think the, the water really helps to open up, bring out those. I think who was it said toffee apples or kind of honey, honey and honey and fruity flavors, I think, as well. Yeah, so Trevor's made a comment. It's not often you see higher ABVs in Irish whiskey. Is that do you think it's something we're going to see more of as they sort of Yeah, I mean I expect trying to yeah. compete, right? You've got all the single cast and cast range releases, it's kind of the next step for them, right? As they get some older. Yeah. New wave yeah, sort of thing. I think I think certainly Teeling are one of the ones that are leading the way with with that in Irish whiskey. There's a lot of a lot of good small producers of um, Irish whiskey now as well around. We're starting to see a lot more of them coming into New Zealand. Um, and I think Irish Irish whiskey has kind of maybe suffered a lot in the past from uh, from from kind of being overlooked because Jameson's was really for a long time the only brand that that held up the Irish whiskey industry single handedly. Uh, but now with a lot of these new producers coming in and they're, um, they're obviously looking to do things a bit different, they're, they're following, I guess, the success of, of Scotch whiskies with different finishes, with these uh, fortified wine cask finishes and going for that higher ABV, which I think is, is nice to see. Um, I think that when, when whiskey is anything below 46%, you're not really experiencing the whiskey in itself. You're experiencing maybe too much water added to it. Uh, so it's nice to see nice to see it at 49.5. I think that's a, a great ABV for this whiskey. Cool. Any other impressions on that one? So you don't have to, I should mention as well, you don't have to uh, drink them all once you've got them in the glass. Uh, do feel free to leave a bit maybe and come back to it. Did I tell you to late there, Trevor? Uh, so do feel free to leave a bit and come back to it. And that's, that might be especially nice to compare if you do still have a bit there to compare that one when we get to whiskey number three. Um, so jumping ahead a little bit, but whiskey number three is in a Madeira cask. Uh, so it's another type of Portuguese fortified wine. So uh, they're all fortified wines that we're going through today, but nice maybe just to, to compare, especially those two side by side. Um, I should mention as well, the order that we're going in today, really we decided to go by order of ABV. Uh, so we're following the alcohol by volume, uh, starting from the, the lowest. So 49.5 being the lowest. 
uh, we're in for a treat today. Um, we're taking it right up to, I think, on, on uh, glass number five, we're up at about 59 point something. But we're going to dip back down again once we get to whiskey number six. Uh, we've put five and six side by side just because they're the two uh, Glendronach single casks. And so it's going to be quite nice to compare them one after the other. Um, and then keeping the, the oldest one to last as well. So the oldest one is going to be our 27 year old Glendronach uh, on number six. Okay, but uh, if we're ready to, to move on then, uh, if you've not already done so, make sure you've got number two in your glass. Yeah, I think we're ready to move on. I was going to say, on that order, it's kind of like, how do we put an order together when we haven't tried them? And only one person mm. here got to open the bottles and taste them all before pouring all our bottles. So, yeah, bit of a bit of guesswork in putting the lineup together, but we'll see if we got it right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, gen so generally, doing a whiskey tasting, I mean, you can go order of ABV or kind of you want to go, yeah, lightest to the heaviest always ending with anything pt if it is but we've nothing pt in the lineup today so um so we've just gone by abv um and this, the tasting notes uh, that are on the um on the booklet there as well um i think some of these tasting notes came from the producers themselves i think i read some of these things on the bottles um other ones i think maybe a bit further on maybe were written by jack or perhaps by ut i don't know uh, but uh, let's see how we go and see what uh, it was. It was a mention of lollies in one of them that made me realise, oh, that's been written in New Zealand because if it was written in Scotland, we call them sweeties. Uh, so lollies are sweeties in Scotland. <laughs> or candy in the US. So number two, whiskey number two. Uh, this is the Ben Riech. Uh, it's our first of our group of three Brown Foreman distilleries for today. Uh, it's the Ben Riech batch 16. 21 years old and it's in a Marsala cask and this one bottled at 54.1% so we're jumping up a little bit in the ABV already so the Marsala cask Marsala is another fortified wine of course that one's from Sicily it gives a lot of that darkness rich very rich darkness to the cask the good thing is that we know that all these ones have no caramel coloring added as I mentioned earlier of caramel coloring I think it was from Ruri uh, so caramel colouring or E150A, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, a natural product like just basically burnt sugar, but can be added to some whiskies. It's allowed uh, by the legislation in Scotland to add uh, to add some caramel colouring to the whiskies. But uh, it's kind of reassuring when um, when producers will tell you that there's been no caramel colouring added. Uh, a little trick if you do ever want to know if caramel colouring is added and it doesn't declare it on the bottle, ask a friend in Germany if you have one. Uh, or find a bottle that's available in the German market because on German labels they always need to write Meat Farbstoff. Uh, so Meat Farbstoff means with colouring and then in brackets they'll put Zucker Kuller. Uh, so Zucker Colour meaning uh, sugar, sugar colour, obviously caramel colouring. Uh, but nice to know that these ones are all uh, no added colour. So this one on the nose, the Ben Riech. Very nice, uh, rich kind of nuttiness to it. I get some kind of dark chocolate or like a, a dark chocolate orange, maybe a dark Terry's chocolate orange. Have a taste. Mm. Very sweet. Good ABV. Um, it's quite quite hot, quite spicy on the finish. It's probably going to go maybe tame down again, a, a, a bit again with a bit of water. Um, but yeah, this one then. So Ben Riach, as I mentioned, is the first of our Brown Foreman distilleries today. Um, the Brown Foreman company or parent company, uh, they took over um, the the whole group in 2016. Uh, so they've got the Ben Riach distillery, the Glen Glassa, which we'll get onto number three. And the final two whiskies we're going to try today, Glen Dronach. This is, these are the three uh, single malt distilleries in the Ben Riach group. Um, ben Riach's history, uh, well, they started at a bit of an unfortunate time. Uh, it was at the tail end of the 1890s. Uh, in the 1890s, there was a distillery boom in Scotland, a bit like the distillery boom that we're seeing today. Um, but the boom obviously led to a bust, and in 1898, 
the Patterson crash signaled the end for a lot of uh, blenders, brokers, and some distilleries. And so John Duff's Ben Reef distillery was uh, one of the casualties of the Patterson crash. Um, so it was opened in 1897, um, mothballed just a couple of years later. And when it was opened, Ben Reef distillery was the second distillery for the, the founder, John Duff. And he already had a distillery close by called Longmorn. So Ben Riach at the time was known as Longmorn II. Um, it didn't even really shake off that name up until the 1960s. Um, and it was in the 1960s that it had its, its first revival. Um, so Ben Riach was kept afloat for a long time thanks to being close to Longmorn and thanks to the fact that Ben Riach had been built with uh, floor maltings. So floor maltings, a traditional style of laying the barley out on the, malt, on the floor uh, and while the kiln heats from below, the barley dries out. And so that malt floor, that malting floor was used by the nearby Longmorn distillery. Um, and so for that period of around 65 years, uh, the distillery was silent, but the malt floor was kept going. Um, and so that was what really helped to, to keep Ben Riach alive. So it was reopened in 1965, um, went through another period of uh, closures uh, on and off. But then it was when Billy Walker came along. Um, so Billy Walker's a, a whiskey entrepreneur has uh, turned around the fate of a number of distilleries, uh, basically the, the ones in today in the Brown Forming Group. Um, he now has a distillery called Glen Allochy, but we're not going into Glen Allochy today. But uh, Ben Riach was the first of the distilleries he acquired with a small consortium. Um, and basically they kind of brought it back to life. Um, so what do you think of that one so far? I can see a few comments there. Yeah, a few comments. Um, lots of dark fruits and prunes. Really good length on this one. Cream brulee. Um, just look at what I've written down. It's, yeah, real fruit medley, red cherries. I thought it was quite hot, the first sip, and then I tried it again and it kind of toned it down. I sort of let it sit there and it was, it was real mouth watering and just like, like at water shot like, it's kind of mm. just like one of those ones that you kind of just keep wanting uh it's sort of yeah you get used to it but the the first set was quite hot wasn't it so yeah it's quite it can be quite overwhelming i think in the first one it's definitely uh definitely not shy yeah um and so the, the casks used in this one then um so marsala it's uh, a fortified wine from sicily um so it's not often used for for aging of Scotch whiskies, uh, so quite rare really to see a Marsala cask. Um, and I should point out that that's Marsala, not Masala, so not the uh, South Asian cuisine. Uh, there's my my Southland accent coming out to pronounce that properly, Marsala. Uh, so Marsala cask. Um, and so I think that gives a, a lot of that nutty almond characteristic to it. Um, I think quite similar to Pedro Jimenez sherry, um, Marsala has a lot of that smell of raisins, maybe a slight, slight rancio character, rancio in a good yeah, way. Yeah, the, um, one of the real key differences in those is like the acidity that comes through in the Marcella wines. Yeah. Um, I think that's like, this is from batch 16, which is a couple batches ago. I think it's probably a key reason why we've still got some is not everyone like Marcella in New Zealand is a cooking wine. It's what you make mm. your tiramisu and you glaze your hands with. So, mm. um, there's probably only like six or seven actual different bottles of Marsala you can actually buy here at any one time. So, but amazing wine for sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Rob said this would be a perfect whiskey with a hunk of strong cheddar. I think he's quite nailed it there, but mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. we couldn't send out little cheese boxes with us for everyone today. <laughs> yeah. There's there's something to add for your picnic list then. Yeah. But no, I think um, yeah, I think Marsala itself would go go great with um, some really strong strong cheeses, even blue cheese with this one. Um, and I think whiskey and a Marsala cask also goes very well with cheese. So this um, this distillery then Ben Riach, it's in the heart of Speyside. Um, so. Speyside is the region really in Scotland that has the most distilleries. Um, if you visit 
distilleries in Speyside and you ask them why are there so many distilleries here, they'll boast about it being the best place for the fantastic water and all the perfect qualities. Um, it's not really to do with the quality of the water, but more so with the quantity of the water. Um, and so there's a lot of water uh, in uh, the region of the, the space, so it's the River Spey. Um, and they don't all use the Spey for their production water. In fact, very few do, but they'll use it for, uh, for the mashing and other things perhaps. Um, but again, with the history of distilleries in Scotland, in Speyside, there was back in like 1800, there was plentiful supply of barley, um, the water, and a plentiful supply of peat for drying the barley. Um, these days, people don't really associate peat with Speyside at all, uh, but Ben Reef actually do quite a few um, peated expressions. I think it's about I think it's about 10% of their production uh, generally is uh, peated. And so people tend to think a lot of the time overlook um, peated space sides. They always think that it has to be Isla for peat. Um, but historically, there were a lot of distilleries in space side doing, doing peated whiskies. Um, so yeah, it's all perfectly set up in the space side region for the distilleries. There's a cooperage, um, which services a lot of the distilleries. There's a few distilleries in Scotland that have their own cooperage for repairing and building barrels. Um, but in Speyside, they have the Speyside Cooperage. Um, it's one of the great places to visit if you if you do make it over to Scotland. Um, and when I was at Speyside Cooperage a couple of years ago, I asked them if I could bring back uh, or take away a little bit of a stave. So I thought I'd bring that to show you today. Um, so first question people usually ask when I show them this is how did you get that back into New Zealand? Uh, I did declare it at customs uh, when I was coming through and uh, they had a bit of a look at it and they said, yeah, I think anything that could have been in there, any bugs or anything would be well long gone. Uh, so they let me bring it in. Uh, but this is an off cut and I think this uh, chalk mark, a little bit of the chalk still on it, uh, was done by one of the coopers to say that this was a bad stave and so they cut it out. So it's a half stave that was just lying at the side and I asked them if I could take it. They said, yeah. Um, so I was there with a a film crew actually from, uh, on this visit. And if you want to check out a little video on YouTube later on, um, just type in Rick Steves. Uh, so not Rick Steen or Rick Stein, he's the TV chef guy, uh, but Rick Steves, he's a, a travel guy in America. He's got a whole bunch of travel books and uh, TV series. Uh, so we were filming a TV series in Scotland. Uh, we made three shows from it. And if you want to just see a little clip of us in Space Cooperage, put in Rick Steves, uh, Space Cooperage. Uh, and you'll see the little clip of us walking around the uh, Speyside Cooperages. Um, so yeah, they'll, they'll um, repair casks at the Speyside Cooperage. Uh, they're not always building the casks from scratch, but usually they'll get them in, in um, basically flat packed, and then they reassemble them. Uh, so they'll reassemble them, take out any staves that are no good, uh, and then they'll char them as well. Um, so you, this one's got a light char. You can see how deep the char goes on the top there. And if I run my finger along it, it's not got so much now, but it still does have quite a bit of the char on it. When I first brought it, it was all over the place. <laughs> if you just move it, the char would be falling off it. And yeah, nice little thing to have. So any other um, opinions or um, impressions of the Benrieff Marcella cask? It's got a good finish on it, I think. No, I think um, I've got to come in and say it's a little dry on the finish and it's probably a mix of, I mean, it, every little thing, some of that oak that's sort of coming through and the acidity from the original wine in the barrels. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, it's probably like, you kind of feel a bit the, the tannic mm. quality of it. Yeah, I think, yeah amazing whiskey though. It can be quite dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, shall we move on to number three? Let's do it. So, so I, I always do like to personally keep a little bit of each one. Um, whenever I'm doing a whiskey tasting, I usually do keep a little bit in the glass and then I'll kind of go back through them at the end. So drink as you like, uh, drink as you enjoy. Um, but that's the way I like to do it. And I like to kind of go back and revisit them. And usually I'll, I'll end when I've got all the six glasses full, I'll go through and decide which one I liked least, and then I'll finish that, and I'll decide which one I liked 
second least. Uh, and I'll keep my favorite one till the end just to, uh, to finish up with that one. But number three, uh, if you've not already got it in the glass, uh, make sure you do. And this one is now from Glen Glasser Distillery. It's the one that actually I was most excited about when I saw the lineup. Uh, funnily enough, it's the only one that I've tried before as well, but I was really excited to revisit it. Um, so it's Glen Glasser Batch 16. It's 11 years old and from a Madeira puncheon, 54.7% ABV. Fantastic nose. Um, and so another of the the brown forming group or, or Benriach uh, group, which now under the uh, brown forming parent company. So yeah, we had this one at a, at a tasting a few months ago in our whiskey club, and it was up against a, a few other really really good drams. Um, there was a there was a what was it now? Uh, having twenty five year old, and there was a a Black Arts. 26 year old black arts and this one held its own i think against those two so on the nose it's got just a beautiful i think ripe kind of um tropical fruit character very sweet on the nose i think <clears throat> this one seems to be quite dividing some odd and interesting noses coming through <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and interesting is a good descriptor. I like that one because that can go either way. Um, and, and interesting could be can be very different. Um, and like I say, I think that can be that can be good or that can be bad. But I think this is a real uh, one that maybe could split the room. I think um, I tend to find that it doesn't have as much on the palate as on the nose. I think it's got a lot more a lot more ground on the nose and then the palate. Maybe it just needs a bit of water to open it up, but the palate, first time I tried it, didn't really deliver as much. I'm gonna add a bit of water straight up. Um, but yeah, Glen Glasser Distillery, it's, uh, well, sometimes classed as a, a Speyside distillery, and this is where we get this nice gray area between Speyside and Highland. Um, it's on basically the edge of the Speyside region, um, so kind of the Northeast edge, um, and it's a coastal distillery. So, this was one distillery that actually was started um, with the intention of releasing their product as, as self, as they called it then, or single malt. Um, a lot of the distilleries back in the 1800s, and this one was 1875, they were started really as places that would supply malt whiskey for blenders. But this one set up with the intention to produce a single malt. So it was never a favorite of blenders. And that's because I think it has a very a very unique character, uh, so maybe maybe interesting or odd, uh, but very um, very different, very very fruity, um, and that's kind of not so preferred by the blenders. They want something that can be consistent and um, uh, easy to, easy to blend with, whereas this one is a bit more challenging. Um, yeah. So yeah, it had a, a quiet period as well. Um, it was. Uh, it was shut down in uh, 1960, uh, sorry, re rebuilt in 1960 and ceased production in 1986 and it was mothballed. Um, and then it was only 22 years later that in 2008, there was a Dutch consortium led by a man called Stuart Nickerson who reopened it. Uh, Stuart Nickerson was a former Diageo employee and uh, he led the, uh, the purchase of uh, Glen Glasser and they really brought it back to life. They released their their first um, bottlings, which were called Revival. Uh, so the story of the the uh, renaissance, really, of the distillery. And then in 2013, it was the third distillery to join the Benria group. So the second one being Glendronach, and the first, of course, Benria itself. What do we think of that one so far on the palette? I can see a couple of comments, Madeira cake. Sorry, I'm just scrolling back up oh, through the comments. <laughs> yeah, sponge, sponge cake nose. Uh, it's, for Matthew, it's unusual, so it might take a bit of getting used to. Yeah, I think I agree there. Might be one I might just sort of hold on to. Madeira cake. 
um, I think that sort of real spiciness and fruitiness from that sort of those wine barrels are really showing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, Madeira is another type of, um, of Portuguese um, fortified wine. Um, it's not from mainland Portugal, but uh, Madeira Islands are actually ever so slightly closer to Africa than to, uh, to mainland Portugal. But it's been a Portuguese territory since uh, probably, I think, the 1400s. Um, footballer Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, some, of them, some of you there might be a fan of Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, he's originally from Madeira. Um, and the word Madeira, actually in Portuguese, it means wood. Uh, so you can guess what the first Portuguese explorers discovered when they got there. Uh, of course, there was a lot of wood, and so they used the wood um, for many things, including making barrels for fortified wine. Um, it's got quite a unique uh, process that they use actually to make Madeira, and it goes through uh, a process of heating, and that's really to, to try to replicate the way that the Madeira wine uh, would have moved around and, and gone through uh, heating while it was on ships back in the 15th century. Uh, they call it estufaging, um, and I've also heard it called a, a zombie wine. So basically the wine is, is cooked. Um, it has to be, by legislation, um, stored for at least 90 days at 55 degrees Celsius. Uh, so during that time, the, the wine is really, really heating up. And so you can just imagine all the reductive and oxidative stages it's going through inside the cask. Um, and I think that adds a lot, of course, to the character of the Madeira, and then also, of course, to uh, whiskey that would be aged or finished in Madeira. <clears throat> Yeah, really stewed fruits, isn't it? Um, mm. Burnt mango for Nick, which is not a tasting note he's used before. And he's mm. trying to keep whiskey, so it's definitely one that definitely stands out, isn't it? Yeah, burnt mango, I like that, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see the, the tasting notes that we have in the booklet uh, mentioned almond. Um, one of the things I kind of, maybe, maybe it can be suggestive sometimes when you read a note or you hear someone else say a note, but one of the things that kind of came for me was like a uh, almond croissant. Um, so I kind of get that bit of that buttery pastry sort of element to it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of almond croissants now. Um, I think that's why I like this. Why I like this whiskey, I've got quite a sweet tooth. So that really appeals to me. I think of all these whiskeys we're trying today, this one was probably the hardest to find any info of or even just anything from the distillery like acknowledging it's been released like it's just one that sort of has appeared mm. batch 16 or 18 or whatever and it's like what's well, come before it we don't mm. know cause the only other batches from the Glass that we've got those 50 year old plus ones, the ones. Yeah. and that's all we've yeah. seen so mm. then all yeah. of a sudden this one turned up so I took it off the supplier and yeah now we're tasting it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a great whiskey, <laughs> personally. Um, yeah, I think it's three three hundred and eighty-two bottles of it around. Um, they do say on the label it's a, a Madeira Punchin. Um, so I guess punchins must must be somewhere in that in that kind of region. So they're not as big, obviously, as a butt. A sherry butt usually yields about can be about five or six hundred bottles, mm. sometimes up to seven hundred, I think. Um, but yeah, this one must be a bit of an in-between size of cask. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's part of the they call it the coastal cask collection um, and they've sent different different expressions to different parts of the world um, so i think they've been quite quite smart in a way by not spreading it too thinly around the world um, and this one it's available only in new zealand australia i think there's maybe some places like india middle east and africa um, so for some reason we're all grouped together and that's where these 382 bottles have ended up um, so i don't know how many you got your hands on teeth but I think there's there's a few a few bottles. I haven't got any. I haven't got any yet, but yeah. I've def definitely sold a few. So. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting uh, mix of countries that they've chosen to send this cast to. Because, I mean, you know, we get so overlooked, being com you know completely at the bottom of the earth, but. Yeah. Normally it's like Asia Pacific and in one half of sort of a release like the Glen Donuts we'll see later, it's Asia Pacific and then US and Europe on the other half. And it's kind mm. of just like they've 
I don't know, has everyone else tried Glen Glasso many times around the world? It's kind of one of those distilleries that are a bit under the radar. Yeah, yeah, totally. Ground form and, you know, you've got yeah. Glen Tronic and Ben Riak and, and Glen Glasso, you know? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I think I think Glen Glasso is kind of the the undiscovered one of the group. Um, yeah. It's kind of the overlooked one, like um, I'd say probably Glenn Dronick takes a lot of the limelight, that's the star player. And then Ben Riak, some people are familiar with Ben Riak and it, it's kind of, yeah, quite quite a wide range. But then Glenn Glasser is the one that's kind of totally under the radar and overlooked. And um, I think it's a real a real gem to, to look out for. Um, this one as well, just to give you the dates on it, it was distilled in uh, May of 2009, I believe. Um, so their their reopening of Glenglasso was 2008. So this is basically well, it was like Christmas 2008. Um, so this is like in the first six months of of the restart. Um, so that, so this is some of the oldest uh, oldest new Glenglasso, if I can put it that way, uh, from the from the reopening. Um, and I think it's sort of showing showing promise for for what's going to come from this distillery. So just imagine when this is getting into 15, 18, 21 years old. I think they're going to have some really good, really good stuff around. Yeah, it's pretty good value for a single cast, isn't it? Mm. A um, yeah. couple of comments here. Um, Kevin's got getting a light, salty finish from it. So that's probably where that coastal mm -hmm. notes coming through, right? Um, I don't know what Port Soy is, but it's apparently the best fiction in Scotland. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah. So Port, yeah. So Port Soy is the beach beside the distillery. Um, so it's up at Sand End beside Port Soy. Um, I don't think I don't think I've been to that beach actually, but I think best beach in Scotland. I think that's debatable. There's a, there's a few that are up there. A few of them, a few of them in Harris and out in the yeah, I've only seen one or two of the pretty dire situations yeah. on the island. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, yeah. Would Billy Walker have released this one or was had Rachel Barry taken over by then? Uh, so, so Billy Walker, yeah, Billy Walker would have been there when it was distilled, but Rachel Barry was the one that selected it and bottled it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I believe it's there's there's no mention of it being a Madeira finish. I think it's been all its life in the Madeira punching. Um, so, yeah, it was, I guess, under Billy Walker that it was put in cask, yeah. um, but, but bottled under Rachel Barry. So yeah, I don't know if you want, if you do want to go back and compare that to number one if you still have it, uh, or you can wait till the end. But um, quite nice to maybe just. Uh, of course, it doesn't really mean anything that they're both Portuguese uh, Portuguese casks, but kind of interesting just to see how the, how the two compare. Um, but I think we'll move on anyway to number four if you don't already have it in your glass. Um, so number four is the Glen Keith. And we're taking a step out of the the Ben Riak group for now, out of the um, the uh, Brown Foreman group, and uh, looking at a, a distillery that's not seen an awful lot. Um, and this one is by an independent bottler. Um, so it's an independent bottler that we have a pretty good range of in Glengarry, uh, and so that's Weems. Uh, so W E M Y S S pronounced Weems. Um, and so this is their Glen Keith, 23 year old, uh, what they've called turmeric caramel latte, suggestive from the start uh, with the name, and it's bottled at 54.6% ABV. Hmm. So it's got a quite a. Now I, I get something on this nose that. Some people don't like, but I, I think it's a really nice note. I get a little bit of the struck match, um, which can be, a, of course, a smell that's related to sulfur, and a lot of people regard sulfur as being a bad thing in whiskey. Um, but it's, when it when it's just at this struck match stage, you know, just a little bit of a little bit of the someone's struck a match about a meter away from you, and you get a little bit of whiff of that. I like that note. I think that's a really nice note. Does Trevor want to unmute himself to explain his comment? <laughs> <laughs> Not had any luck with Wayne's cast or <laughs> Trevor? Do you want to unmute? <laughs> <laughs> so 
so yeah, so, so Glen Keith, um, it's actually one of the more recent distilleries of the ones that we'll, that we're tasting today in terms of when it was opened. Um, we've got three distilleries that were um, 1800s, but this one was 1957. Uh, so actually one of the first distilleries opened uh, in the 20th century uh, with the Patterson crash in the late 1890s. Um, Scotch whiskey went through a period of decline, but then in 1957, Sheba's brothers decided to build a new distillery and it's, it's this one, Glen Keith. So Sheba's brothers, of course, being most well known for the blend, uh, Sheba's Regal, they've got a number of other blends and this was intended to be um, malt whiskey that would be filling for those blends. Um, when they set up the distillery, it was actually set up for triple distillation. Um, again, this is in Speyside and again, a lot of people uh, generally think that triple dist distillation is Irish, uh, that uh, only double distillation uh, should be in, in Scotland, but it's a, a style that's often referred to as well in Scotland as the lowland style. Um, so probably the most famous distillery in, in Scotland that's doing triple distillation is a lowland distillery, Ochintoshan, and both Ochintoshan and Glenkeith, uh, when they were opened, it was intentionally to produce this triple distilled Irish style, uh, and that was to supply blenders. But they switched to double distillation, uh, she, um, Glen Keith. Uh, so they switched in uh, the 1970s. Um, so this is double distilled. Um, they also went through a, a period of closure or mothballing. So 1999 until 2013, uh, the distillery was closed. Um, so this one, 23 years old, it was distilled in 1996. So just a few years before they were mothballed uh, and bottled in 2020 by Weems. So yeah, I get a lot. Of, I get the caramel, toffee on the palate. It's um, it's a sherry sherry cask or sherry butt, but it's um, certainly not a sherry bomb by any means. Maybe a maybe a probably a refill. Certainly not a first fill. Any impressions on that one so far? What do you think? Hey, Colin. Hey, uh -huh. <laughs> Just what I'll chime in. Just because you're from Ponsby Road, and I thought this whiskey is perfectly named for our Ponsby Road friends. So. <laughs> I don't know. You have to put like soy in there to be Ponsby, I think. The Chimerick Camel Soy Latte. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a gorgeous whiskey. Good mm -hmm. No. So yeah, I think the um, the names that they've, they've gone with for the Weems casks, if you've not come across them before, some of them are quite quite inventive and quite um, yeah quite imaginative. Uh, so this one, turmeric caramel latte. Um, I don't think I've ever drank a turmeric caramel latte, um, but yeah, turmeric turmeric's got all kinds of health health giving qualities. So hopefully, a bit of that's in the whiskey. Um, but yeah, Weems, Weems is, uh, if you've not come across them before, an independent bottler um, based in Fife. Um, they've got a lot of a lot of really good, really good stock available. And they've also started their own distillery. So if you've not come across it before, it's King Barnes. Um, so that's out by St. Andrews. And it's the one of the one of the first distilleries built in the region of Fife, which is now quite a booming, um, booming region within the lowlands. Um, and so the Weems family really are starting to make a name for themselves in the in the Scotch whiskey industry. What was Rory's comment there? Yeah, so Rory is saying it's the most poised and elegant whiskey we have tried so far. I'm guessing he's on his fourth whiskey because he said elegant, but <laughs> what do you think? Assuming it's second or third fill, obviously it's not that intense on the sherry notes you typically get. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. 
strong sulfur notes, but better mouthfeel than I expected. Definitely agree on that sulfur notes. Probably one I'm, I've tried a couple of times and I'm going to leave that one and come back to see if it sort of blows off a little bit more. Um, I haven't tried it with water yet, but they're saying it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Definitely get your struck match description, but I think more phosphorus than sulfur. Very unusual. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Nick agrees too. Yeah, yeah, funky. Yeah, I mm. think that that kind of that funkiness is something that some people really don't like. <laughs> uh, once you once you get on it, it's um, yeah. Yeah, I think with these wings ones out. that are all sort of named for their dominant, you know, flavor profile from whomever. It was, it was supposed to be Charlie McLean that was the first one that helped them sort of name them. That's right, yeah. And I think they've been pretty good at naming them to sort of what you'd first get, but then I haven't really tried that many blind mm. that can really agree with it. But um, it's certainly different, that one. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice to it's nice to try a distillery that you don't see very often. Um, I think Glenn Keith. I'm not sure if they even do any of their own um, own bottlings. I think they're few and far between. So really, it's only in independent bottlers that you'll find something like this. So it's nice to kind of see what the um, see what the distillery is like itself, and not just um, put into a blend. Do you know who owns Glen Keith? Um, Glen Keith, I think. Mostly? What was that? Where does it end up mostly? Um, I think it's Shivas. Okay. So I think they've got a number of um, a number of blends. The most famous are Shivas Regal, but I think they've got. Um, I think it's Passport Passport Blend. I don't think that's one that we get here. A um, hundred Pipers is another one. Yeah, they've got a whole whole number of blends that they. Um, that they release around different markets. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at the, some of the tasting notes there. It's said finished with a spicy ginger tea, um, turmeric spice. You do get do get a bit of that turmeric, something something certainly warming in the finish. Are we ready for number five? Take that as a resounding yes. So number five, we're going to get into the Glendronics now. And this is where we really jump up in the ABV. Um, so this one is the Glendronic cask 8558. Uh, so these two from single casks. Um, this is batch 18. And the first one's a 12-year-old. And it's bottled at 59.4% ABV. Um, both number five and number six are both from Pedro Jimenez casks, uh, so a type of sweet sherry. And so Glendronach really is the, the star player, I would say, within the within the Ben Ria group, within the uh, Brown Foreman group of distilleries. Um, so it's the it's the Cristiano Ronaldo or the Lionel Messi of the group. Uh, it's the one that's the really the star. Um, very often I'll recommend to people so people come into the shop and they'll ask um they'll, they'll say they're buying a gift for somebody um and i'll ask them well do you know what they like and they'll say no and i'll say do you know if they like pt whiskey and they'll say i don't know uh, so i'll say okay we'll avoid the pt whiskeys and then generally they'll say how much they want to spend and usually if it's about a hundred dollars uh, i'll immediately recommend the glendronic 12 year old so i think that's just a really good sherry cask whiskey um glendronic are well known for doing great sherry casks and so these two, uh, nice to have a look at two individual expressions from single casks. Oh, yeah. So never, never getting the sherry. There it is. Yep. 
so yeah so glendronic is in the the highland region it's again another one that sometimes people will uh, lump into speyside it's kind of just east of uh, east of the main speyside region um on the palette on that one i didn't talk about the nose but let's go back to the nose i think it's a bit of that mentions here golden fruit marmalade toffee nut brittle certainly getting those rich fruity characteristics sweet fruits Hmm. And yeah, on the palette, you're getting all that raisin, treacly, syrupy type things. Hmm. Yep. So, so as I mentioned, the distillery, this was the second one to come into the, the uh, Ben Riot group. So after Billy Walker had um, taken over Ben Ria, he, a few years later, decided to look for another distillery. Um, his experience through working with Burn Stewart um, as, a, as a blender and in operations, he knew the quality of uh, the, uh, Glendronach. Um, and a lot of people will compare it to Macallan, uh, or very often compared to old Macallan. Um, so no comment really on uh, what Macallan is doing today. Uh, but Old Macallan was uh, typically known for those really rich sherry casks. Um, and that is what I think you still get uh, from, from Glendronach's. So this one, like I say, a fantastic expression from a single cask. Uh, they've put out these different ranges of the single casks. Maybe T can tell us a bit more about that. Um, but I think it's a good way to kind of, you can even do like a, a lineup, which I know some people have done, of uh, individual casks from the same year. And really get into the kind of very small, small differences uh, between each one. Um, so I think they're mostly in um, Pedro Jimenez casks, maybe some in Oloroso, a few port ones as well. Um, T, do you know more about the the batch and the the range of? Yeah, casks? so um, each batch that's released each year, I think it's about twenty four releases and twelve. Um, different bottlings will come here in Asia Pacific and the other 12 Europe sort of thing so it's 24 releases each year and I think it's only uh, yeah four to five wine casts and mostly sherry and port is probably all that we seem to see mm. uh, range of ages and a range of uh, distilling, distilling dates and stuff so it's kind of just they're uh, really just going through the warehouse and picking things out so mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen any of these that are Marsala casks or Madeira. I think nah, not that sort of widespread, pretty sort of true to tradition, right? So, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a yeah. few comments. So for nearly sixty percent, that's pretty drinkable. Um, mm. I'd have to yeah. agree. That's kind of typical of those PX casks. That's you know, a bottle of PX sherry is. Um, sometimes three or 400 grams of sugar per liter. So it's it's very rich, very sweet. Mm. And that sort of quite highs that um, alcohol quite well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another one that really appeals to my sweet tooth. I think it, um, it really has that, that sweetness, that raisin sweetness coming through. Um, maybe dates, some nice dried dates. Yeah. But yeah, Glen, Glendronach then, um, as I mentioned, a great, great core range. Uh, it's all the way from 12 upwards. Um, the, the 21 is also a great one, which I know that someone on here, Tim, uh, purchased a bottle yesterday. Um, and let me ask you a little bit of trivia question here. Quickest answer in the chat. What is the collective noun for a group of crows? And I'll give you a clue. It is the name of the. I get run out. I'm sorry, it's not that then. Now, when, it, now, now when I looked this up, when I read this, I thought if they use an, an American term, then rooks. So it's right. rooks. Is that the same as crows? Isn't it parliament? Parliament. It's not yes. It it's might be. Um, parliament. Parliament. Crows. When people started writing murder there, I thought. That does sound that does ring a bell, but it's parliament. So a parliament hey, hey, 
Are you sure it's not referring to ribbons, not crows? Well, on the Glendronach website, I don't know if they're putting it in American English, they call it rooks. Parliament of Owls is what Kevin's saying. Well, according to the Glendronach official website, which I'm sure they know all about birds, uh, but they have they have a a resident parliament, they say, of uh, of rooks or crows that live at the distillery, and that's why they've given the name Parliament to the 21 year old. I mean, they've got a pretty big marketing team now, so yeah, <laughs> sure. yeah, they can and certainly they based can... in Scotland, of course. <laughs> yeah, once you get a big marketing team, you can make up facts on collective nouns. There's someone Googled it. A horde, hover, murder, muster, or parcel. There you go. Now I'm just going to take a second to call out Ruth, who is pretty much like Miss Glendronic. <laughs> we know that she loves Glendronic, so I'm going to be pretty interested to see what she thinks about these last two whiskeys. So there you go, Ruth. Stay on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Araha. We've actually just, I've got a couple of other Glendronic fans here with me, and it's its delicious. It flies, it's 59%. It's easily drinkable. Mm. It stands. We've just decided we are buying a bottle of this, which probably, um, yeah, <laughs> says best all best. I need to say, but it's, um, it's delicious, and I can't wait to try the next one. Thanks. <laughs> nice. Good to hear it. Nice to hear your voice. Uh, you too, Colin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, I even, when I started drinking it there, I forgot it was 59% and I hadn't added water. It was just so drinkable at 59% already. Yeah, so yeah, I think compared to other, other sherry whiskies, it's just phenomenal value always in Glendronic. Um, so with these single cash releases, of course, they're a bit more. I think the prices are on here. In fact, this one is phenomenal value. Uh, so it's $200, a cent under $200. Uh, I think you can't go wrong with that. Um, yeah, really good for a single cask. Okay, so if there's any other comments on that one feel free to pop them in the chat um, but I think we'll move on and get number six in our glass and maybe quite nice if you do still have some of the the five left there might want to do these side by side just because they are both um, Glendronach PX casks but the difference of course is in the age and it's a different cask um, itself so it's contained of course the same type of fortified wine but it's a different individual cask so whiskey number six, it's the Glendronach cask 6049. And it's again, part of batch 18. This one is 27 years old. The ABV on this one is 49.2. And again, it's of course from a PX Pedro Jimenez cask. So yeah, it might be quite nice, like I say, to go back and compare five and six, but I think that on, on six, Maybe it's maybe it's just the ABV. Maybe if you tame down five and bring it to the same ABV, it might not have the same effect. But you're not getting as much initially on the nose. Might open up with water as well. But great nose again. Yeah, there's that that sweetness, that raisin. Can't fault it. <laughs> yeah, I've just seen Trevor's comment there. I just want to sniff it all night. Yeah, me too. Yeah, if I if I if I wasn't hosting here and had to keep talking, then I would just be I'd be sitting for ten minutes nosing that. <laughs> so yeah, let's get it in. Get it on the palate. Yeah. Again, you're getting all that date, dark chocolate, coffee. 
Fenomenal mm. whiskey. What do we think of that one so far? Great. <laughs> yeah. It's too soon to talk about it. Like, I need more time to sit on this. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. So the so the, the oldest whiskey I ever I ever nosed. Um, I didn't actually didn't actually get get to get my lips on it, uh, but it was a a forty five year old uh, Mortlach. Um, so I was in uh, in the Craig Ellicke Hotel, which is in Speyside, in the heart of Speyside. And I was there with a Polish couple. Um, so I worked as a tour guide up until COVID. And I was with a, a Polish couple driving around Scotland. And he was a big fan of Balveni. So we visited Balveni Distillery. We visited a few other distilleries as well. Um, and we went to the Quake Bar in uh, Craig Ellicke Hotel. And he'd had a, I think he'd had one or two whiskeys already. I was driving, but uh, he'd had one or two whiskeys. And then he asked the person at the bar, what's the oldest whiskey you've got? Um, so he didn't ask what's your what's your best whiskey or, or what's the most popular whiskey. He just asked what's your oldest whiskey. He was a lovely guy, but um, he, he was a big fan of Jim Murray as well. Uh, but he just asked what's your oldest whiskey, and he said we've got this forty-five year old Mortlach. Um, so he said, okay, what's the price on it? I can't remember the price now, but he he had to go on his phone and transfer some more funds into uh, the card he was going to use to pay for it. Um, and then I, I noticed that, and it was, it was super dark, super syrupy in the glass but the nose was just wood um, I think it's been too long in the cask so age is just a number of course um, and that saying goes well for whiskey um, because age is a number maturity is a character um, and so a lot of the time you can get a whiskey that might only be like the previous one 12 years old uh, but it drinks really well this one is 27 I think is really bloody good as well um, but I think sometimes when you get over that over that age, it can be a bit too much, and so certainly that forty-five year old Mortlach that I that I nosed, um, it was just it was just like wood, just oak, just uh, nothing nothing else going on in the nose. But yeah, this one is just phenomenal. Yeah, so I'm looking I'm looking at the tasting notes in the booklet. We've got aromas of dark chocolate coated in cherry. Yeah, kind of about the cherry, <clears throat> like a maraschino cherry. Winter spice, angelica, walnut, mint. Yeah, I get a little bit of mint. I think it's got a really good finish. What do we think of the finish? Yeah, I think Rory will leave McKellen out of the equation, but um, it's fantastic, no question, but quite a short finish. A fantastic medley. I'm just reading out some of the tasting notes from everyone. Worth buying a bottle, even if it means facing a divorce. I'll give you a discount if you want to buy one. Michael. <laughs> um, yeah, perhaps the Angels took a bit too much. Meaning, so what? What did this come out at? About forty nine percent. Yeah, forty nine point two. Might be one of those ones, like one or two more percent higher, sort of just cuts through some of that sort of sweetness and stuff a bit more. But mm. the question to the group: Would you rather have one of these bottles or five? So one of each of the previous bottles. Mm, that's a great oh, question. Oh, that's so hard. That was. So I'd say, you know, quantity. <laughs> oh, this is good. This is good. I actually, um, I'm sitting here with my dad, Jack, and he said that this is like candy floss for adults, which I couldn't agree with. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those ones. It's kind of like, you know, you get to those bottles where you can just smell them. Like, this one is one you can just sort of stare at. It's got that kind of, it's not crystal clear almost. It's real that. Amber, uh, you can just yeah. That's why I put it in the lineup because. <laughs> <I wanted to try. laughs> yeah. 
And the Finnish Colin sad. That's what it is when it's over. <laughs> well, the Finnish the Finnish is sad. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. That's a good descriptor. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think this this would definitely be the one that if I'm gonna go back to the rest of these, this is the one I'm gonna to keep till last. It's gonna be the one you wanna sort of spend the most time on, you wanna sit with and yeah, get to know it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so we see number four, the Glen Keith that didn't actually say on the label what what type of sherry was used. Um, it could have been Oloroso sherry, but I think um, these two, the, the PX, they certainly have that, that super sweetness, that super raisiny thing to them. Um, and personally, that's why, that's why I love, like I say, with my sweet tooth, I think that's um, right up my alley. <laughs> So yeah, overall favorites, favorites of the lineup. Anybody? Yeah, there's a couple of comments saying to add some water. It's, I'm always the same when it's something like this. Do I want to add water to it or do I not? Mm. I think certainly a, a drop of water, not of course not to dilute it, not to bring down the ABV too much, but just to just to break the oil, just to open it up. Yeah, special drop for a special occasion. Mm. A few people obviously the um, twelve year old Glendronach a favourite, but same with the Glenglasser. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, I mean, this is obviously. Phenomenal. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no, no doubt about that. I think value for money. The Glen Glasser is fantastic, as is number five. Uh, that Glendronic at two hundred dollars. I mean, that's excellent quality. I think we're um, we're at the end. So if anyone wants to unmute themselves mm -hmm. and ask a few questions, we're I think we can. Um, yeah, it's not too many people online that we're not going to talk over each other. But we're all. Um, I think it's like T when we were putting together the session, or you were asking ideas for it. It was very much a, uh, oh, what do the staff want to try? And uh, uh, we managed to find some other people that were interested, thankfully. Yeah, I know. I know you're a huge fan, Rory, of uh, wine cask finishes. Oh, you, uh, anything interesting and unusual is uh, usually the go. Mm. Definitely a big teeling fan, um, but you know, I own I, I have about three of these ones, and I'm happy I get to try them without having to crack into them just yet. <laughs> and what was the um, what was the eleven year old cask strength one you mentioned? Um, so yeah, this um, is an epically andronic uh, cast strength that we had, just in another 11-year-old PX, uh, roughly the same price as well, I believe. Oh yeah. So yeah, from the same batch as the 12 cast 2039, which we got recently, I shared with some of the guys. Do not get to try it, Colin. I did, I did, but I didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I think I uh, I stuck a label on it and I think I did put on eleven year old Kiet Glendronach, but then I didn't find out what it what it was actually from, so I didn't know the cast number and things. Yeah. There's a good question here, and it's like the range that we've tried today is undeniably good. So what's the best hundred dollar whiskey? And is Ooh. this twenty seven year old ten times better at a thousand dollars? A good question. Yes. Mm. So does it does it have to be a hundred dollar whiskey that's in the same type of profile, or can it be a hundred dollar whiskey like an Ard Big Ten or a okay. or an Ard American? And go for five two hundred dollar whiskeys at twelve year old. Or you could just get it ten times lower and enjoy it. <laughs> Let's say you could have the 
Glenn Gathau Octaves, which is only about yeah. 170 bucks, but which is a fantastic whiskey. It's none less, though. Well, I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until the next, uh, until we get the next batch, what I think we've just finished two and we'll be hopefully getting three soon. Okay. No idea. <laughs> I thought they only did it once, but they do quite a few releases, do they? I remember there was a, the Hancock show a few years ago. I tried batch one. We got batch two now. I'm going to assume we're going to get more. Yeah, um, I'm certainly hoping that we get more Glenn Glass or single casks in. Oh, definitely. That I Madeira more, is anything to go by. Get, yeah, more along that lines of that Madeira. Fantastic. Hey, well, we've got quite a few. They're all 47 years old and older. Yeah, so. <laughs> Everyone's got three yeah. or four thousand dollars and wants to pull in to get them. Yeah, yeah. Find, find 20 mates. Pitching. Yeah, I've just seen Tim's comment there as well. Looking forward to the Glendronic 21. So, Tim picked up a bottle of Glendronic 21 when he picked up his sample bottles yesterday. So, yeah, hope you enjoy that. Hope you enjoy that. That parliament. Um, think of those. Tea, Can you crack what's... it? the sort of current age of that Glendronic 21? It's about 24, isn't it? Uh, you might be across it a bit more than me. Yeah, we'll, need to have a look at the, we'll need to have a look at the bottling dates because I think the final release of that old stocks in 2023. And I think at which point it's a 26 year old, so. Yeah. So how do you tell when it's bottled? Uh, uh, there'll a, be a little code along the bottom. Yeah. And so there's a, a um, how do you explain it? So obviously Glendronic was closed. I haven't even opened the, the packaging. Shall I open the packaging? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's pretty hard to see the uh, bottling data on it sort of due to the colour of the whiskey. But if you have a hunt mm. around, you should be able to find it. Oh. Well, I'm sure it's going to be a great learning curve for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's, yeah. the story is that it's obviously the distillery was closed during the 90s so oh. when they reopened they had a 12 year old to release straight away but they haven't been distilling for 18 years or whatever so the 12 year old was between this time period 15 to 20 years old that was when they blew up with the 15 year old because the whiskey stock was actually closer to 20 years old now the 18 sort of run out and the 21 year old sort of 23 24 years old yeah because they haven't been up uh, reopened for 21 years sort of thing so yeah there's a very Hello, good chart you can find on uh on google images showing Hello, sort everybody. of the, the final bottling age that sort of Oi. thing oh, hey, hey, jack. Jack. <laughs> i just want to yeah, can I, see jack, I, I can see jack wanna, with some jack daniels yeah of course on. there's jack daniels in the picture where are you, Jack? <laughs> Colin, well done. Awesome. And um, okay. with, Rory, with that, um, you, with the Rory beside you, you know, I could expect some wonderful staff selections coming up. So um, go for it. Awesome. And well, those that attended, you've been treated right. to a great tasting. So um, awesome. And um, from out here at Mackerel, the sunny yeah. um, precincts of the far north. No, no. Well done. Mm. Uh, I've got a few ideas for okay. uh, some more more tasting, so I'll I'm have sure to push, have. put them by teeth. We'll see how we go. Yeah, okay. like the lot. Let's get to them sooner rather than later. Jack, is right. that still the Glendronic 27 in your glass, or are you onto the Jack Daniels? Oh, no, no. The, the only problem with that 27-year-old, like I said, the finish was terrible. It was gone. Short. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it the, just um, means you uh, have to drink more of it to keep that uh, flavor in your mouth. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> you only need a little taste of something like that to appreciate it. The, the, um, the Weems was a stunner. Well done, guys. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. I did. Are we sure the Glen Keith Tumor uh, Caramel Latte wasn't uh, distilled in Ponsonby? <laughs> <laughs> We'd be, be very wealthy if it was. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. did not like it we had a weems bottle um recently that kind of it was way off it seemed like it was corked right even though i don't get that with whiskeys it was real 
sort of soapy nose. But that one's quite different and interesting. I haven't, we haven't opened many of the Glen Keys or anything that we've got. Yeah, I think it was, um, look, I think Colin hit the nail on the head when he says struck match because, you know, as soon as he said that, I thought, of course, of course, you know, and you sniff it and you get the struck match, you get the sulfur. The taste was definitely funky, but I actually thought it was a very nice, nicely balanced dram, but I'm just not sure. It, it's a little bit odd, a little bit funky, as some people said. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And those sorts of things stand out in a lineup like this. Because, like, would would you have said that if you were trying it on its own, right? Not next to yeah. all of these. So that's yeah. same with like wine, beer, and stuff. It's like, how can the everyday man pick out something when it's slightly off? Um, mm. I don't. Yeah, I certainly don't think it's off. I think it's just it's nah. It's like, it's like different. Yeah. And very it's something different. That I, I don't know. One of one of my favorite uh, lesser lesser big name distilleries is Linkwood. And I kind of always get that little bit of a struck match. Uh, phosphorus, I don't know the chemist amongst us, maybe can explain phosphorus and sulfur if there's a, if they're on the same uh, spectrum or if there's a big difference. Yeah. But it's a, it's a note that I, that I enjoy and I warm to. I don't know if it's, of course, a lot of these, um, these uh, appreciations of taste and things are related to the, uh, related to memories from childhood, perhaps. So maybe it was memories of finding a box of matches in the street and just, lighting them all and having a great time but that's uh that struck match thing i just Where did really, you want, grow really want to yeah. <laughs> Glasgow. Um, i would say like coming from more of a wine background i actually really enjoy that sort of sultry struck mm. match character in whiskies i really like mm. a bit of funk um it's always like a nice pleasant surprise mm. just going back to your question before trevor the Balvenie 14, Caribbean cast. Yeah. Distributor. Doesn't know how mm. to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a pretty fantastic dram. It's awesome. Yeah. But it's one of those ones that's kind of like um, those rum casts, even our big drum at the time was just silly. And now we, now we got like cool. an extra shipment of it and it just sold out straight away. Yeah. Um, but who knows what's happening with Belvini, to be honest. Mm. Um, and I think I've just seen Kyle's comment as well about shine a torch through it, just in case that wasn't picked up. I think that was to Tim. That was in relation to the the seeing the bottling date on the yeah on the. Show your face, uh, Kyle. Kyle. No, he's busy bottling the next tasting. I think so. We'll leave him to it. I <laughs> oh, yeah just. Should have got onto this. Yeah, I think he's doing the beer just quickly one for, as we um, speak. Yeah, for everybody, um, thanks for joining tonight. Oh, this afternoon, it's been pretty awesome. And I think it's one that I spoke to these guys, Colin and Rory and Kyle, who did our bottling for us. It's the it start of lockdown. I was like, what do we want to try? And it's like, we've got this range <laughs> of clean tonic and variant batches. And it's like, let's get into it. So, that was definitely the um, inspiration with this tasting, but um, obviously with whatever's happening at the moment, we've got October um, virtual tastings up for the rest of the month, and for whiskey, we're going to do Ben Reac mm. uh, in about ten days or so, and that's some of the new bottle, uh, the new bottles and the new labels, the new core range which I've just released, the ten and twelve in the 10 and 12 smoky um and we'll do a couple of single casts as well so that's on october 20th i think if you're keen to join we've also got some other uh next saturday we're going to do southward distilling who are on cuba street uh and they make gin and they're laying down a few casts of uh whiskey as well and they're going to take us through their gins and do some cocktails next saturday uh we're getting any new make from them or uh, no, ah. <laughs> I can if you want. Uh, yeah. T, who, <laughs> who's hosting the Ben Reak tasting? Uh, so Kenny from yeah. Hancock's the distributor and importer. So Kenny's the New Zealand awesome. ambassador for uh, Brown Foreman, pretty much as well. So yeah, um, he's pretty he's yeah pretty awesome to listen to. So if you want to yeah, come try some of Ben Reak new stuff. Yeah. Mm. So um, 
I heard you mention that we might be able to sneak a few single casks into that Ben Riak one. Uh, that new Moscatel making an appearance there. It is making an appearance there. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> excited about that. I think I listed what's, what we're going to taste. So, yeah. I haven't had a look that much, but we do also have the old Moscatel bottling from them as well, I think, which is quite interesting. If we can do another side by shout. side. Maybe we should change it up. Yeah, do the, the new bottling and the old bottling of the Moscatel. Have a look side by side, would be Good quite idea. cool. Oh, no, Just I'm everyone cool. signing off. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Jack and stuff. Happy birthday. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Dawn and Kay and Pukakoi, glad you got your packs today. We'll see you at the next tasting. But yeah, I'm just going to stop the recording and then we can all keep going. <laughs> it's been okay. a pleasure, everyone. And hi to Lloyd and uh, Melanie and whoever else watches on the recording. <laughs> oh, did Lloyd